Okay, so here is something a little bit different. Not just color and elbow per se, but how some of the techniques and concepts of color and elbow can be applied to another like combat situation. So this idea originated from a friend of mine who does longsword fencing. And he sent me some footage of him and some of his students in what's called the longsword clinch. And he mentioned that this is a configuration in which trips might be an option to attack with. Uh, sure enough, like when you look back into the history of collar and elbow, there is at least one reference to two guys in a faction fight, like a stick fight in Ireland in the 19th century. They were locked up in a clinch. They were trying to control the other's weapon. Uh, one guy latched on a crook, like that classic collar and elbow move where you weave one leg inside and around your opponent's leg and then use that to off-balance him. So one guy got the crook, used that to topple the guy forward, and then took his stick and basically beat his head in. So trips were a recognized and apparently quite effective form of attack in a weapons-based grappling situation. So I said, okay, let's have a look at this and let's see if there's anything we can suggest for the longsword clinch specifically. Now, what me and Corinna, my demo partner here, realized quite quickly is we don't know a fucking thing about swords. So we tried to experiment and get the correct hand and arm configuration from the longsword clinch video, but we realized very quickly that we were not going to be able to do this. So we just said, fuck it, and threw our swords away and said, okay, we're just going to work out of a very basic wrestling single collar tie instead. So same, you know, rough configuration, you know, we're in clinched with our arms up high, you know, in this case around each other's heads as opposed to around each other's swords, but we're standing upright, our hips are in close. We can show some things from there, and then if anyone out there has a better idea of how to work with swords, they can hopefully just apply the concepts and the movements with a little bit more uh, yeah, expertise when it comes to actually handling the weapons. In general, though, I think this longsword clinch position would definitely be a good opportunity to attack with trips, because you're standing upright and you have your hips in close to those of your opponent. And that's often the most difficult thing to enforce in a wrestling situation. In a traditional, like say, freestyle wrestling stance, you tend to be more hunched over, your hips are more pulled back, which makes it quite hard to hit a trip because your feet are just so far away from those of your opponent. So in order to hit a successful trip in a normal wrestling situation, half the battle is make them stand upright, their hips are now in close to yours, and trips become an option. In this longsword clinch position, you're already there. You're already standing upright, your hips are already in close, and you have some form of control over your opponent's upper body. Now, before we start looking at tripping techniques, there's one key concept to keep in mind. And that's before you start attacking with your lower body, you need to introduce movement in the upper body. What you'll often see when people start out using trips is that they get too focused on the lower body side of things. And they start fishing around with their feet, trying to knock their opponent off balance without first introducing movement in their opponent's upper body. And what that means is that you are essentially compromising your own balance by 50% while your opponent is still nice and rooted on both of their two feet. So the way I often put it is, imagine I was wrestling with a clone of myself. You know, we're the same height, same size, same strength, same level of technical expertise, same cardio and everything. If I'm wrestling with that clone, we are perfectly equally matched, 100%. But now imagine, for whatever reason, I just decide to lift one foot off the ground and start wrestling with one foot on the ground. Now all of a sudden the balance swings quite clearly towards my opponent because I've literally just killed half of my balance and half of my movement. You would never voluntarily do that. And yet that is exactly what people do when they start 
preemptively fishing around with their feet for trips before they've compromised their opponent's upper body. So before I start tripping my opponent, before I voluntarily lift one of my feet and briefly compromise my balance, I want to make sure that her balance is compromised first. And the way I do that is by introducing movement in her upper body, either forward or back, side to side, diagonally, whatever. But I need her, her center of gravity moving before I start attacking with my lower body. So just keep that in mind in general, whether you're dealing with longsword or stick fighting, judo, wrestling, whatever. Don't start trying to trip people if you haven't introduced some form of instability in their upper body and their center of gravity first, because otherwise you'll end up getting reversed all day long. Okay, so having covered that key concept, let's have a look at a few potential techniques from this clinch position. And the first one we're going to look at is what in collar and elbow we would call the back sickle. Uh, in judo would be called osotogari, major outer reap. Uh, like I said, I don't want to just lunge in and start attacking with this without having first compromised my opponent's balance. And for this one to work, I want her moving backwards. And I can do that either by pushing or first by pulling, and then she reacts by moving backwards of her own accord. But basically, if your opponent's center of mass is moving backwards, this is an opportunity to attack with osotogari, or the back sickle, as we would call it. Now, an important thing to keep in mind for this technique is I need to ensure I have enough space to swing my right leg across and behind her. So I don't want to be standing directly in front of her. I want to be a little bit off to the side. If I try and do this while I'm standing directly in front of her, I'm going to block my own leg and I'll just end up kneeing her in the thigh by accident. So instead of directly in front of her, I want to step a little bit off to the side. So basically her right foot is between my two feet. And now when I step in and drive her backwards, I have the space I need to swing my leg through and reap, calf on calf, roughly. So once again, just to show the entire thing, I drive my opponent backwards and over her right shoulder, leg comes through and reap. Okay, so another option from this configuration is what we would call in collar and elbow, the twist over the knee or the tuck. So as before, I'm driving my opponent backwards, but instead of reaping with my right leg, I'm stepping forward with my left leg, putting my knee behind hers, thus blocking her leg and preventing her from stepping, and then driving her backwards in that direction. So I step around, knee goes behind hers, and then drive her in that direction. Again, same principle as always. I want to introduce movement in her upper body and then block her lower body. So move her backwards, block with the knee, and drive. Now, let's say I'm trying to push her backwards. I'm trying to get her moving backwards so that I can hit my osoto or my twist over the knee, and it's not working. She's too solid, she's too stable. I'm pushing, I'm trying to introduce that movement backwards, and it's just not happening. She's driving into me, she's not going anywhere. So I can use her forward momentum and then attack with a trip in the opposite direction. So instead of getting stubborn and just constantly trying over and over and over to push her backwards, I take her forward momentum and then I quickly jerk her towards me instead, in which case she's going to want to take a rapid step forward to catch her balance. And then the moment she does that, I stick out my foot and I block her at the shin, just above the ankle. Very common move in old collar and elbow matches had various different names like the toe lock or the cross toe. So basically anytime your opponent refuses to get pushed backwards and they drive into you instead, toe lock is always there. Just pull, make them take a big step and block them so that that step becomes impossible, they go down. So those are three potential options from the longsword clinch or really from any kind of clinch if you can get your opponent to stand upright with their hips in close. Again, keep that concept in mind. Before I start attacking with my lower body, I want to introduce movement in my opponent's upper body. 
first two attacks we looked at today, the back sickle and the twist over the knee, I drive my opponent backwards, step across, reap with the leg, or step around, block with my knee at the back of her knee, and then drive her where she can't take that step anymore. Alternatively, if I can't get her moving backwards, if she's stubborn and she keeps driving into me instead, jerk her forward quickly, step to the side, stick out my foot, block her at the shin just above the ankle, and then twist her forward and off balance. So, like I always say, try it out, and let me know how it goes.